guys, Cork here again. So this is the fourth video in my Classic Law Hunter Mechanics uh, introductions. So previously we focused mostly on the mechanics of the hunter player themselves. But today we're going to be focusing on pet families, um, what attributes different pet families have, what attributes are specific to individual creatures in the pet families, and um, what use what usefulness each family provides to the hunter again i've talked about there's a lot of resources out there telling you showing you what the abilities are what what pets are recommended for certain situations but what you'll find as a hunter player is that there's certain pet families that don't get much attention but are very good at doing certain specific things depending on what your goals are in classic i always emphasize that WoW Classic is a massive game with many different goals and objectives. And it's really up to you to decide what you want to be doing and how you have fun. And a big part of playing the Hunter class is not only going out into the world and finding unique pets or pets you think are cool looking, um, but also mastering control of your pet and really building a bond with the creatures you do attain. So I'm not going to be going very specifically into specific creatures because a lot of the fun is finding these creatures for yourself and developing that bond with them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. I put together a little PowerPoint presentation because I figure that's probably the best way to disseminate this information. This isn't going to be focused so much on the, the data itself. It's going to be more of an analysis of what you know, get your mind running about the possibilities of different pet families and help you find what pet is the best for you. Um, so why do pets matter? So there's two big reasons that people seek out specific pets. One is for performance, that the pets they're seeking out have certain attributes that are conducive to what they're trying to do. And then another big underrated component of it is aesthetics. Looking badass is a big part of World of Warcraft. When you get rank 14 and you equip that High Warlord or Grand Marshal set, you feel like a badass. And pets can act in a certain way. Not only feeling badass, but feeling right. You know, if you're playing a Night Elf, sometimes having an owl just feels right. Or an, or an orc having a boar just feels right. It might not be the best class, for, the, be, the best pet family for what you're doing, but if it feels right, that goes a lot farther than you might imagine. Classic WoW is a marathon, not a sprint. So whatever makes you feel right and whatever's going to help you log on for the day, um, whatever's going to help you farm consumables for the raid, whatever's going to make you excited to get back into the World of Warcraft and push your character, you know, that can go a lot farther than just having the best pet. Um, what's the, you know, there's no real point in having the best performing pet if it just doesn't feel right or you're not into it and you just don't have the motivation to go out and farm or do challenging solo content. So aesthetics are highly underrated, and I kind of want to emphasize that the margins on performance between pet families is pretty slim in reality. So I actually think aesthetic, um, the best case scenario is that you combine aesthetics and performance. So you feel right playing your character, you feel accomplished for having a cool pet, and you can also turn that into performing well in whatever kind of content. So there's many different types of content you'll be performing in and different pet families can excel in different areas. So we're gonna be talking about leveling, PVE, including dungeons and raids, and there's a very big difference between these two. And the primary reason there's such a big difference is that in Classic WoW, pets do not have an avoidance mechanic for AOE abilities. So in a lot of raids, your pet is prone to dying before it can get off a lot of damage. And so the actual performance, the raw output of your pet, is not nearly as important in raids as it is in dungeons, where you can use your pet to tank mobs that need to be picked up or that are attacking your healers, or contributing more overall to damage. So keep in mind that in raids, pets are, are not as useful, which can actually be advantageous to players looking to get pets that simply feel right rather than do the most raw DPS. We're also going to be talking about PvP. PvP is where many pet families shine that are otherwise neglected. We're also going to be looking at challenging solo content such as killing elite mobs, farming, um, doing certain quest lines, 
that require a lot of kiting and other things. And again, certain pet families can excel at that. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the mechanics that play into how a pet performs. And these are distinct. There are certain things shared by all pets. There are certain things that are shared across families of pets, like a boar versus a bear. And there are certain things that are creature specific. So the creature you find in the, the world, one cat may have different attributes than a different cat on the other side of Kalimdor or something like that. So things that are shared between all pets. So when I say shared between all pets, I mean these things are available to whatever pet you tame. And you can train these things or give these things to your pet, no matter what the pet is. So we have things like growl and cower. Growl generates extra threat when your pet uses it. It's not a taunt, it doesn't snap aggro away from whatever it, ta whatever it growls. It just gives a large amount of bulk threat to help your pet maintain aggro to tank for you or for someone else in your group if they pull aggro. Cower does the opposite. It's like faint from the rogues, it reduces threat. So you can manipulate the threat and the aggro of your pet using these two abilities, growl and cower. And cower actually has quite a few uses where you're juggling mobs. You know, you pull aggro with your pet, you nuke it, your pet's low HP, you cower, distracting shot the mob off of it and kite it while your pet recovers. So things like armor and stamina, these are things available at your pet trainer. Every couple levels you can actually train these and then you can teach it to your pet. So as you level your main character and your pet, you can further increase armor or stamina. And the same goes for resistances. And you can train resistances for your pet um, across all pet families, excluding holy damage, uh, which is kind of a special case as far as spell families go. Um, and then also the talents you pick on your, on your hunter character will automatically be applied to your pet. So if you're in Beast Mastery and you um, learn Frenzy, which increases the attack speed of your pet, that will apply to all, any pet you have. It's not family specific. And then shared across families. So each pet family has its specific diet. So this is the food. Remember in classic food costs money and you have to feed your pet to keep it happy. And the more happy it is, the more damage it will deal. And this can actually play a big part because vendors, there's not a vendor that sells every type of food. Well, there are certain ones, but the kind of diet your pet eats can actually play a big part in convenience factor and traveling because you have to make sure that your pet is happy. Otherwise, it's gonna be doing pretty pitiful damage. The other thing is family abilities. So certain pet families can learn certain abilities. Um, the way family abil pet family abilities work in Classic WoW is that in order to learn how to teach a pet an ability, you have to tame a mob in the open world that knows that ability and that rank of the ability. So if you tame a level 10 cat, it will have rank one claw and it will not automatically in rank up its claw, you have to go find another pet or another creature that has a higher rank claw, tame it, use the ability, and then your character will learn the ability to teach that rank of that ability to a valid pet. So just something to keep in mind. So as you level, you'll be frequently going out to uh, hunt down specific mobs that have a rank of an ability you want to upgrade or teach to your primary pets. And then there's something called stat modifiers. So I have a visual example later that kind of explains this. But pet families are better at doing certain things. And the three categories are damage, armor, and HP. And each family has certain modifiers to their base stats that either give it more damage, more armor, or more HP. And you'll see by family that's broken down. Then as far as creature specific attributes, the appearance, so how they look. Um, the, what I'm using as my, for all this uh, information, I use a website called Petopia. They've been around since forever. They're the premier resource on finding appearances, uh, spawn locations, attack speeds, all these things, ranks of abilities. So 
it's pretty common to have Petopia open on a tab while you're out in the world hunting for specific creatures. The next important thing to talk about is attack speed. So different pets within the same family can have different attack speeds. And the attack speeds range from one attack per second to one attack per 2.5 seconds. And this is a, an attribute that gets a lot of attention in Classic WoW because of certain advantage, advantages of having different attack speeds. Keep in mind that the damage is normalized. So the DPS of your creature is always the same. It's just attacking at a different rate. So if you have a creature that um, deals one, attacks every one second, each attack will do 2.5 times less damage than a creature that's attacking uh, every once per 2.5 seconds. So superficially, when it comes to damage over a long period of time, attack speed does not affect DPS. However, there's advantages and disadvantages to having a specific attack speed. So having a low attack speed, I'll start with a low attack speed. So having a low attack speed, there's two primary advantages. One, the damage is more consistent, meaning that it's attacking faster. So if it misses an attack, it will readily attack again to maintain damage. The percent of the time that it will miss will be the same as someone with a, uh, a lower, a faster, or slower attack speed, but it's more continuous. The other thing is that it more hits means more spell pushback against casters. This is why uh, creatures with low attack speed are more, cop are more popular for PvP players, because getting more spell pushback on a priest who's trying to heal or a druid who's trying to heal uh, just gives you that much more pressure when you're trying to DPS them down. Keep in mind that most healing specs, I think pretty much all healing specs, get ta talents that reduce spell pushback. So this advantage is not um, nearly as impactful as you would think. However, it is there and it is something to keep in mind. Now creatures with a sl much slower attack speed, they're, they're more impulsive. Meaning their DPS is the same, but it comes in big blocks. So you're hitting a target every 2.5 2 seconds. So each attack is doing a lot more damage. But this means that it's not getting off more attacks, so it's not interrupting or pushing back spell casts. So if a priest is channeling a 1.5 second heal, your bear will attack them and they can get off the heal before your pet will even attack again. So that's something to keep in mind. The advantages to having a slow attack speed, there are advantages. One is that it's more snap aggro when you're out in the open world. So you can send in your bear, it will attack them, get a large chunk of damage, a lot of bulk threat at the start. So then you can immediately start following up with your abilities because it's like snap threat. It's a big, powerful attack that gets the creature's attention. So a big hit with a growl means it's gonna be sticky to your pet. It, uh, it's also, it can also be very useful in PvP because of the burst damage. And a way to think about this is if a, if a creature with fast attack speed is attacking a target, if, any, if, if at any point the target makes space between your pet and themselves, your pet is losing a lot of damage because it can't continually attack them. However, if you have, if you have a creature with a low attack speed, it only has to make connection every 2.5 seconds or 2 seconds to get its full damage out. So if you're fighting something like a frost mage who frost novas, your slow attacking pet will lose less damage overall because it only has to make a connection with the mage every two and a half seconds. You can think about this in my kiting mechanics guide, how we can run between auto shots and still maintain full damage. This, the slow attack speed plays into that where your pet only has to make connections when it's valid to attack to maintain damage. So just some things to keep in mind there. Um, the other thing that's creature specific is the abilities they have when tamed. So every mob, every tameable mob in the open world has ranks of different abilities specific to their family. And so you'll be seeking out these mobs in particular in order to rank up the abilities you can teach your own pet. And many of these abilities can only be found on one or two mobs in the entire world. 
The final thing that's creature specific, and this is a very special case, is in classic WoW, mobs can be modified by something called caster stats. Caster stats are given to mobs, they're a mechanic put in place by Blizzard, that makes creatures that are meant to be using spells or have high damage, it makes them easier to kill. So they have lower stamina and lower armor. And this is meant to encourage players to focus down dangerous mobs quicker. Because they're more of a threat, you target them, you kill them quicker. And a great example of this is the Defias Pillager, one of the most all-time homicidal mobs in Classic WoW. Their fireballs hit for, many of you know, massive amounts of damage, but at the same time you can target them and kill them quickly. So it's a give and take. The disadvantage for Hunter players is that there are actually beasts in the world who are designated casters. And the issue with this is that their abilities do not do extra damage, but their armor and HP is modified to be much weaker, and their attacks are weaker. So again, Petopia has a list of creatures with caster stats. Just something to be aware of. If you tame a mob you think looks cool, and it seems to be performing very poorly, there's a good chance it has caster stats. And there's really no advantage to having a pet with caster stats. So now I'm going to actually get into each pet family. Now that you kind of understand what attributes each pet can have, I'm going to be using all my resources from Petopia. Again, please check out the website. They have spawn locations, spawn times, appearances, ranks of spells, anything you could hope to ask for when it comes to understanding different pet families. Um, I have the links here. I'm going to be taking their stat templates off of Petopia and using them here just to give you a, a visual indication of what each family possesses. So I'm going to be going in alphabetical order because I don't want to give any preference to what I think the best pets are. I'm just going to be talking about each family within the context of itself to give you some possibilities of what you can do. So the first up is the bats. So you can see with my cursor here, these are information that we just went over. So Petopia uh, designates bats as an offensive family type. And below you see the stat modifiers. So one means that it's not modified at all, it's standard. So if no classes had modifiers, they would all have one, one, H, one health, one armor. One, it's a coefficient. So one times what it, the base stats are, meaning it's not modified. But you can see that the damage, I'm only going to go through these once because once you understand what these numbers are telling you, you can just visually see it as I talk about the pet family. So they have a damage coefficient of 1.07, meaning that compared to the base stats, they do 1.07 times more DPS. And this is designated high, which is why the pet family is considered offensive. So pets do, their modifiers are slanted towards doing more damage. These are abilities the family can learn. So cower, remember cower and growl are threat, are threat management tools that all pets can learn. The, the uh, abilities that, that bats can learn, the family abilities are bite, which just does a, a burst damage, but it has a cooldown. Screech, which reduces the damage targets deal so this is a defensive tool that reduces incoming damage. And they have dive, which is a sprint. So it increases their movement speed by up to 70%, I believe. These passive abilities, these are things that you can teach them. And remember, we have HP, armor, and then schools of resistance. So how you train your pet, these are all available to teach it, but there's a limited number of training points. So if you're going to Molten Core, you can emphasize on stamina and fire resistance to keep your pet alive for longer. But these are, these are available to any pet. These aren't bat specific. And then we have diet, which is fruit and fungus. So these are just valid choices that you can feed your pet. And it's very limited. There's only two options, only fruit and fungus, no meat, no bread, no fish, none of that. So they are limited. So now that you kind of understand what these templates are telling you, I'm just going to talk more generally from here on out, and we'll pick up the pace a little bit. So bats, very great offensive tool for PvP, PvE. Um, 
some neat appearances down here. Limited diet. Uh, screech is useful uh, while leveling just because it, your, pe your pet is offensive, but it's also reducing the damage it takes. So it's a nice balance there because you're going to kill things faster. Your pet's going to take less damage. Important thing to note about the pet family or the bat family in specific, specifically is that when, as your pet levels up, they get bigger. And because bats fly, they, get, they end up getting a very large wingspan, meaning they're kind of a menace in the face of their players. And if you're facing clickers, which does happen, there's a lot of times that they, they actually can't click on you or the target they're going to heal because your massive bat's up in their face and around their player model. So just an interesting use of bats. And bats are pretty common. Uh, off the top of my head, there's a very fast attacking bat from Zolgarub. That's very common because it has a very low attack speed, they're offensive, and they can sprint to their target. Bears. Bears are one of the most common early game, um, one of the most common early game pets because they're very prevalent. They have high uh, health and armor, meaning they're primarily uh, defensive. They can learn bite and claw. I haven't talked about claw yet. So bite is large, takes a lot of resources to use, and it's bursty, but it has a cooldown. Claw does not have a cooldown. So this is a focus dump for your pet. So your pet will continually to use this, continually use this claw ability as long as they have focus to use it on. So if you've pulled a lot of focus on your pet, they can essentially pump out a lot of damage using this claw. Think of it like a heroic strike for warriors. Warriors, when they're rage uh, saturated, they can just spam an ability, claw is similar, but it's instant cast. It doesn't queue up on your next auto. They have a very uh, unlimited diet, pretty much. You can pretty much feed them anything, which comes in handy, because you can collect food just by questing, and the chances of you getting a food item that is valid is very high. One last thing to know about bears is that they generally have the slowest attack speeds, so if you're looking for that impulsive, bursty type damage, bears are a good choice, and they're tanky. Next, we have boars. Boars are one of the favorites. Um, defensive. You see they have a very low damage modifier, but they're very defensive at the same time. Really nice diet, easy to maintain. Dash is again a sprint similar to dive, so it's important they have that because they can make a connection. But the biggest thing to talk about boars is the charge ability. Now this, bil this ability makes them high performance pet in leveling and in PVP. So leveling, charge, is like the warrior charge, your boar will dash to the target instantly, essentially. It immobilizes them for one second, so it counts as a CC, and it increases the damage of their next attack. While leveling, this is really important because you can, while you're questing or whatever, you can instantly get your pet to the target, hit them with a high burst of damage, generating a shit ton of aggro, meaning that you can instantly start laying into the target without a fear of losing aggro. So they're very effective levelers because they're tanky, they don't die easily, and what's rare for this family is that they're defensive, but they have aggro generating abilities, meaning that they're a complete tank, because tanking has two parts, taking less damage, mitigating, and also doing enough damage to maintain aggro on the target. So with boars with char up, charge up, they're very effective. In PvP, it's the same story, it allows your pet to make connection with them. And it also gives you defensive utility. So while I'm PvPing with a boar, I usually do not keep charge on autocast. I manually use it. And it's very useful because you can intercept warriors who charge on you with your own charge. So a warrior can begin charging. You can respond with your boar charge, immediately immobilize them, and make the space you need. So very useful for PvPing. And I see a lot of high-level hunters having one of these in their stable for that exact purpose. Carry-on birds, they're an all-arounder. They have a lot of abilities you can tame. So if you were looking for that versatility in terms of what abilities you want to be using, uh, they're very useful. They have dive, so having a sprint is very useful. Um, limited diet, fish and meat. They look cool. Um, if you're looking for a good all-arounder, carry-on birds are a good choice. Cats, probably the most common pet family. They are designated offensive, and you can see their damage modifier is 1.1. 1. 1. 1. So they have very high damage, 
Um, they have a lot of versatility when it comes to abilities. Um, they have a cat specific ability called prowl, and this is a stealth mechanic. Um, your pet moves slower, but they also learn dash, so you can stealth and then get to the target. And when they come out of stealth, it's sort of like a rogue ambush in that their next attack does extra damage. These are very popular for night elf players in particular because night elves can shadow meld and you can prowl your pet and both you and your pet are invisible. And so you can get a very strong opener in the open world or in Warsong Gulch, for example, um, to get your opener and burst them down. Pets have a predispo predisposition for having very low attack speed, which is good for pushback, but this is contradictory to Prowl because it only affects your next attack. So as you come out of Prowl, you get a bonus damage, but each time you hit is much lower. So the burst potential from Prowl is lowered because of the low attack speed, but one of the highest damage pet families, and you'll see a lot of these. They have like quite a bit of, they have very unique skins. Um, a lot of their appearances are unique to just one or two mobs. Uh, so in terms of appearances or uh, finding a unique pet with maybe a longer respawn, uh, respawn timer um, is a great way to show off your knowledge of uh, classes. So, crabs. Crabs are very defensive, but their damage modifier is not too low. So if you're looking for a high armor pet, um, I kind of didn't go into this too much, but armor and health are both defensive stats. Health is better for taking magic damage and physical damage because it increases your tankiness against both. Armor only reduces physical damage. So I find that when leveling, armor is the preferred stat simply because um, most damage your pet will be taking will be physical. And there's advantages to having low HP in that you're still getting the mitigation, but because your mend pet restores a static amount of HP, you can restore your pet while it's fighting. It will be taking less damage and you'll be restoring a higher percentage of its max HP per tick. Um, think of it like a sponge. The bigger your sponge is, the more water it will hold, but the longer it takes to wring that, all that water back out of the sponge. Um, so that's up to preference and what you're encountering. This poor HP would be bad against playing a Frost Mage or some uh, another caster who's trying to eliminate your pet from the, you know, you get polymorphed and they kill your pet to uh, put you at a disadvantage. Having low HP just makes it easier for the caster to kill your pet. So again, it's a give and take. A uh, pretty uh, wide diet here. Uh, so, you know. All those things can be pretty easy to find. Fish in particular, because if you have the fishing trade skill, it's easy. You can just find a lake nearby where you're questing and get some food pretty easily that way. Crocolisks, crocolisks, probably the most un, one of the most uncommon pet families, and it's pretty easy to see why. They look pretty cool. They get really big, so if you're looking for something intimidation factor or just to look cool, crocolisks are a good choice. They're very limited on their active abilities. They have bite, but they don't have claw, meaning that they're focused, they don't have a focus dump, meaning they can only do burst damage when bites off cooldown. And a lot of times they'll be uh, focus saturated just because they don't have anything to do, anything to use that focus for. High armor, decent leveling, but limited. Gorillas, this is an interesting pet family. This is one that is, I think, underrated simply because it's, it doesn't get a negative stat modifier on any category. It gets a bonus to HP and damage, so they do pretty decent damage. A lot of times people would think of these as purely defensive, but they have decent damage. They have bite, again, limited diet, but they have a pet specific or a family specific ability called Thunder Stomp. And Thunder Stomp is extremely unique in the, in the pet families in that it's an AoE ability. It has a long cooldown, um, but if you're looking to farm or you're looking to run friends or low beasts through dungeons, Thunder Stomp is a great way to cover the aggro for your entire group instantly. So you can send in your gorilla, 
Thunderstomp the whole pack and they'll all stick to your gorilla. And you have decent armor and high HP to back that up. So uh, a lot of hunters keep one of these in, in their stables, in their stable just for farming or for running people through dungeons because you can't find anything like Thunderstomp in any of the other families. Hyenas, uh, poor hyenas, they, didn't, they don't get much love. They, uh, they're again an all-arounder. They don't, they're not specifically good at any one thing. One thing to note is they do have bite um, and they do have dash. So they do have a sprint to make connection with the target and stick to them. So they do have that going for them. The other thing with hyenas, this might seem kind of goofy, but they make the most annoying noises when you're killing somebody. So if you really want to, if you want to go camp somebody or gank them or just really annoy people in duels, you can get a hyena and it'll be howling and snickering up in their face the entire time. And so they have a psychological warfare thing going on with them, just to keep in mind. And I think, I actually think they look pretty cool, so. Owls, now, owls used to be underrated, but now they are getting the attention they deserve as far as a leveling pet um, and PVP. Notice they, they're offensive, they have a very high damage modifier, so they're gonna be doing a lot of damage. They also have access to a focus dump in claw. They have screech, meaning they, they're doing high damage, but they are also reducing the damage they take and you take because it's a debuff to the target. Uh, they have dive, which is a sprint, and they don't have low HP or low armor. So there's a link that I'll put in the description because there's a really good post on Reddit. I think it's called like why you should have an owl or like why owls are the best pet ever. So I'll link that because that, that, that can vouch for owls better than I could ever. Um, also, they look cool. They fly and they get pretty large as well. Raptors. Now, these are com almost as common as cats when it comes to DPS pet pets for pure damage. Only raptors and cats have a 1.1 damage modifier. And they also have bonus armor. So they're actually very effective when it comes to dealing damage just raw output. They have bite and they have a claw rage dump. So if you're looking for a cool raptor pet, you are going to have pretty high performance in terms of DPS. Um, their diet's limited. They only eat meat. The thing that they don't have that cat, a lot of cats do have is that um, they don't have sprint. They don't have a dash. So it's harder for you to maintain connection with the target. But when they do make connection, they're going to be doing a lot of damage. Raptors are a good choice if you're in a horde starting zone or you don't want to have a cat, and you, but you still want to have the high DPS impact. Next we have Scorpids. Scorpids are defensive. They have a focus dump and claw. They have reduced damage, but they have a very unique pet family ability called Scorpid Poison. And it has a cooldown, but it stacks up to five times on the target and it does nature damage. And nature damage means that it ignores armor. So on high armor targets, Scorpion Poison is not going to be reduced. Um, and it takes up a debuff slot on the target. So in raids, you're not really going to be using a Scorpid just because you don't want to take up a debuff slot with Scorpid Poison. Um, however, it's very useful in PvP for several reasons. First is the fact that Scorpid Poison ignores armor. Second off, that it's a debuff that ticks. So if you're fighting a rogue, you can use Scorpid Poison to prevent restells. And third, and the most important reason, and when you get into high level PvP, uh, you'll kind of understand this a little bit more, but as it's a poison, it takes priority over Viper Sting. And Viper Sting is an ability that ticks, but reduce, doesn't reduce HP of the target, but reduces mana. And it's extremely powerful in uh, competitive PvP, in battlegrounds, in open world, uh, even in duels where you're trying to outlast the opponent by reducing their mana. And Scorpid Poison takes priority on debuffs. So if you have Scorpid Poison on the target and the Viper Sting on the target, uh, someone might try to uh, cleanse the uh, target or abolish poison or whatever it is, and it will remove the Scorpid Poison, but not the Viper Sting. So this is very useful for maintaining Viper Sting on targets and something that a lot of healers aren't expecting and it might confuse them for a little while. So I recommend Scorpids if 
you want to take advantage of the unique mechanic that Scorpid Poison brings. They also have very high armor, so they're decent tanks as well in the open world. Next we have Spiders. Spiders, um, they don't have web in Classic WoW. They do have high damage modifiers and they're good all around. So they're another, they're another choice for just an off offensive pet family. Um, they don't have a focus dump and claw, however. They only have bite. So they're going to be focus saturated quite often. Um, these are another great psychological tool. As you level up, your pet will get massive and you'll have a giant spider attacking targets. And real phobias, like real arachnophobia, is a very real thing. It's not just a little scary. I have a friend, I know someone who actually has arachnophobia and they can't complete quests in any area with spiders. So if you're looking for another psychological warfare tool, spiders are a great choice. It's a little cruel to take advantage of somebody's uh, actual phobia, but you know, all's fair in war and World of Warcraft, so. Tall Striders, some people think they look goofy. For me, it reminds me of a, I guess an ostrich or a uh, cassowary, which are actually pretty brutal if you know anything about cassowaries. They are a little bit underrated because they have pretty good stat modifiers. They have high HP um, and they also learn dash. So they do have a way to stick their target and get to them quickly. Um, this could be again, psychological just because, you know, a goofy chicken tearing your shit up, especially if you're beast mastery, you can really have a high impact with these, can really mess with people's heads. And they, they do have a, a good toolkit for doing that. They have a damaging ability and they also have a sprint. So keep an eye on tall striders. Turtles, well known for being extreme tanks. They're defensive by nature but they have a very low damage modifier, um, which is to be expected, right? They're a turtle, so it fits in with their, their RP just right. They do have, they have a bite, so they do have a damage ability. They have a fish on their diet, meaning that it's easy to acquire food for them. And they also have a special ability called Shell Shield. And this is a very long cooldown ability, which drastically reduces the damage your turtle takes. So one of the things that I've done in the past is farm blue uh, dragon spawns and other elite mobs that have very nice loot tables. And a lot of the times at late game, the problem isn't damage, the problem is keeping your pet alive. Um, and turtles can fulfill that role very easily with their high armor and their shell shield if things get serious. So they're a very strong consideration for a tank. Again, Part of tanking is also maintaining aggro, which they might struggle with. But if you use your abilities correctly and you know you throw a feign death in there, um, turtles could be right for what you're trying to do. So next we have wind serpents, another really, really popular pet for a variety of reasons. One, the modifiers are right for doing a lot of damage. The other thing is that they have dive. So dive is the sprint. So they're mobile, they can stick to targets. Um, however, their, their claim to fame, as you say, is Lightning Breath, which is their class ability. And this does nature damage. It can be used from range. It's probably, I think it's the only pet family ability that can be used from range. So if your pet gets uh, Frost Novaed, you can still Lightning Nova the target. You can also pull from range using your pet and there's certain dungeons where it might be advantageous to have your pet pool with lightning breath from a distance, uh, keeping your group safe. Um, the other thing to notice is that because it does nature jam damage, it ignores armor. So in, ter in terms of raw damage, lightning breath is the highest damage ability that a pet can learn, simply because it's, it does high damage anyway, but it ignores armor. So when you're fighting something like a warrior, Lightning Breath can crit and actually do, um, you know, up to 250 crit damage just with a pet ability, which is pretty significant. And again, it's range. So these are very popular PvP pets. These are actually quite popular in raiding as well. Uh, earlier I mentioned that because pets die so fast in raids due to AoE damage, they don't get much use with a Wind Serpent. However, because Lightning Breath is ranged particularly, you can 
maintain, you can use lightning breath off cooldown while keeping your pet in a safe location. You're not good, it's not gonna be that noticeable, but if you're trying to min-max your damage and you know your pet would die otherwise, you can just simply use lightning breath to augment your regular rotation. So something to consider. Wolves, wolves are the last pet family. Um, they are generalists. Good stats across the board, good leveling pets. They look cool, good for RP, especially if you're playing like a, an orc and you want to have a wolf that matches your mount. That's pretty cool. Um, they have good versatility with their abilities. They have a, a, a damaging ability. They don't have a, a, a focus dump like claw. They do have dash, meaning that, you know, again, they can sprint, they can maintain a connection with the target. They can reach targets faster. Uh, their real claim to fame is Furious Howl, though. So Furious Howl is an AoE buff that's used on cooldown by the wolf. And within a, a range, a radius of the wolf, all targets will have a bonus to their next attack damage, their next damaging ability. This affects you, this affects your, hunt, your pet, and it also affects your party members that are in proximity. In terms of the open world, wolves are generalists, so they're they're decently tanky and they're not going to have a reduction on damage. Um, most, a lot of wolves see a lot of play in raids, however. Similar to the Wind Serpent, they're useful because they can be effective without having to be in direct combat. So you can have your wolf stand by your side or in the middle of a, a, a melee group and just have it use Furious Cooldown, uh, fur Furious Howl on cooldown and give a little burst every couple seconds, every like 10 seconds I believe to your entire party. And so it can contribute without having to be in direct combat. So I hope that gives you a little insight onto the advantages and disadvantages of each pet family. Again, there's no correct choice and there's a lot of best choices for certain situations. Um, next, I'm gonna show you, my, my pet stable changes quite frequently, but I'm gonna show you what I currently have in my stable and what I uh, consistently return to in terms of in-game uh, utility. Again, pets are part of your toolkit. So my, uh, my toolkit currently looks something like this. So these are the names of the creatures that I currently have. I'm not gonna go into too much about why I have them. Hopefully you can piece together what you've learned as to why these three pets would be most advantage, ad advantageous to me. And again, not all creatures in a pet family are equal. They have different attack speeds. So um, I would encourage you to go to Petopia and look through some unique pet looks, some unique pet attack speeds. Um, experiment around with what you find in the open world. There are undocumented attack speeds, I'll say, or certain things about pet looks that are not always documented and changed depending on the patch. I know Classic is gonna be using 1.12, so Petopia is a great resource. Um, you can't, you don't know. You can say, okay, this, you know, this cat is gonna be doing the most damage and interrupting the most. But until you use the pet families, uh, you don't know what's gonna be right for you or what's gonna be right in specific locations. So I do encourage you to go outside of guides and get some hands-on experience. And what something that might be very appealing to you might not be appealing to others. And there's never really a correct answer. It depends on how you control your pet and what you're trying to accomplish. So that's it for the pet family overview. Again, I encourage you to check out Petopia. Thanks to them for having that information out there for us to use. So next episode, I'm not sure when it'll come out, but I'll be going over PvP tricks and I'll be showing some dueling and... Um, you know, show off what, what hunters are capable of in PvP. So, thanks again for watching.